Close enough. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Hacking HR Global Conference. And this is your morning session, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging in the new world of work. And I am your moderator, Dr. Tana M. Session. And today I have my wonderful three panelists that I've had the opportunity to get to know over the past few, I guess, couple yeah. of months now, maybe. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go around like the Brady Bunch. I'll start with Jorge. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm pointing yeah. in the right direction. I'm Greg. Greg Brady. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I'm Jorge Quesada, uh, right. Vice President uh, uh, of Diversity and Inclusion here at Granite Construction. Yes. And so next we have Garrison here in the corner. Garrison, go ahead and introduce yourself briefly. And then I'll have you guys share your brief bios with everyone so they'll know who's around the table. Yeah. So um, I'm Garrison Gibbons and I'm the head of people at Notch, which is a startup in New York City. Wonderful. And then right below me here, I have Deborah. So Deborah, go ahead and say hello to everyone. Hi, my name is Deborah Levine. I am the editor in chief of the American Diversity Report. Wonderful. So what I would like for you guys to do is just tell people um, who are joining us today a little bit about your background and what brought you to this particular event and panel. And then we're just going to dive right in and start our dialogue. Deborah, go ahead. Start us off. Me? All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so diversity has been part of my life forever. I grew up as the only Jewish little girl on the island of Bermuda. Uh, I was the only Jewish little girl who uh, found herself in Harvard Divinity School classes. And I have completely devoted myself all these years to the issue of uh, how we think about each other and how we can make uh, harmony without homogenizing. And so uh, I'm here with, uh, with all of you, uh, delighted to share uh, what I have done in my, my various 14 books that, are, that look at uh, religious diversity and how to rethink about diversity in general and what people are doing to make teams more diverse, more innovative, and a better quality for their bottom line and for their employees. Wonderful, I like that. And someone, uh, Tori says she likes what you said there, what harmony without homogenizing. I like that too. I'm gonna yeah, have to remember that. I'll give you credit for it. Is uh, yeah. not homogenize. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, and next Garrison, if you wanna tell everyone a little bit about you and what brought you here today. Yeah, so um, I am originally from Mississippi. Um, I grew up in a unique uh, liberal household in Mississippi, fortunately, um, very Catholic family. Um, and I came out as queer when um, I was 18 years old. My brother was queer um, and came out five years prior and ultimately um, committed suicide, which kind of knocked me back into the closet. Um, and so I kind of set on this journey of kind of making sure that I was carving a path for myself that allowed me to belong and allowed me to be in a place um, where I was able to make an impact with the work that I do. And so ultimately that landed me in HR, um, but also took me out of Mississippi. And now I live in New York City where I had the pleasure of working at several companies, starting several uh, diversity, equity and inclusion councils, ERGs. Uh, around diversity and inclusion, both on the hiring side from the comms perspective and on the HR side as well. So that's kind of a little bit of my story and kind of understanding that outside of the urban bubble, um, there is a vast uh, country, as I'm sure we're hearing a lot about in the media, uh, a vast country that um, diversity and inclusion looks completely different um, in those areas than it does uh, where I'm fortunate to live now. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, yeah, Garrison. Yeah, and definitely. Jorge. Thank you. No, Karenson, thank you very much. And again, thank you for your courageous post on LinkedIn the other day, uh, introducing the, yeah. the, the panel here. I, I guess, Fatina, if I could just for a moment, just take the opportunity to also thank Enrique Rubio for bringing us together. I know there's yes. a panel, we were talking about it. So all of you that are on 
right now in this conference, if you can give him a nice little shout out today, um, because what he's doing here, he's truly putting on an event that um, I'm really excited about. Uh, so I'll be really quick because I think, um, so I'm from San Salvador, El Salvador, and um, in San Salvador in Central America, um, you don't really, you don't know the water that you're swimming in. So to me, diversity was not a concept when I was younger, right, thinking about. It wasn't until we got to, uh, you appreciate this, Garrison, New Orleans, Louisiana, and not too many, yeah. Jorge, 1969, right? So I was George, and all of a sudden, you <laughs> talk about, uh, you know, homogenizing or assimilation, as we've learned to call the word as well, <laughs> right? I assimilated very quickly, and uh, my mom and sister still call me George, surprisingly, after all that time. But, um, you know, I fast forward because I can tell you it was in October, it was a Wednesday, I was in sixth grade and I had made the football team um, at Cathedral Chapel School in Los Angeles. And that day, uh, my brother was suffering from a seizure. And I knew that if I didn't go to practice, I wasn't going to play in the football in the football game that Friday. And so a decision needed to be made. And by October, my mom had exhausted all her time off in the secretarial pool in the company that she was working for. So either it was going to be a babysitter taking care of my brother. It was going to be me. I was the break glass in case of emergency person. Right. And um, and so or it was going to be my mom. And what that meant was she was not going to get paid for those eight hours and there was bills that were not going to get paid. Mm. So my mom was making calls and you can tell she was running frantic. She uh, literally looked at me and said, you got to stay home. And right away, you know, in sixth grade, as you can imagine, I made the seventh and eighth grade football team. That meant the world to me. But um, so I stayed home. Everything went well with my brother. But my mom got home early um, that day um, because I was expecting her around five o'clock and she made a beeline right to her bedroom. And that moment and I share this story, especially even this month, because we're celebrating women right this month. Um, it's one of those cries that um, if you ever heard one of your parents crying this time, it was my mom. And um, she was very emotional. I rushed into the room to try to give her a hug and she pushed me away. And so when people ask me why I do this work, literally I can, I can go to that Thursday, right? And tell you that my mom pushed me away and said, if you ever become in, become a supervisor, and that was the term that we use then, right? Supervisor, um, don't you ever treat a woman like I was treated today. And I think that was the day that I became an ally. I didn't know it, but it was imprinted in me. And so I'm here today, I'm here for this work because I, I find myself being an ally um, in the various diversity dimensions that we're gonna talk about today and the, and the diversity dimensions that I think that exist. And so I'm really excited um, being here with all four of you. And, and again, thank you, Enrique. That's my story. Wow, what a journey, thanks. I, I could visualize the whole situation as you were describing it. So thanks for sharing that, Jorge. We didn't talk about that on our call, yeah. I love that. Um, so just briefly, just as a moderator, I'll briefly tell you a bit about me. So I'm Dr. Tana M. Session, um, the owner of my own company, consulting company, TanaMSession.com. And for over almost 30 years, I've been in human resources and have been the head of HR for different organizations. And as a result of that position, um, about five, well, probably about eight years ago, I got heavily involved in diversity and inclusion and rolling it out in an organization I was working for in New York, a management consultant, and just really grew a passion for it. And now as a consultant, I get to go in and help companies take a bird's eye view of what their DNI and also equality programs look like, as well as gender pay parity to understand where the gaps are and what initiatives can they put in place to help close those gaps. So I love the work I'm doing, love being here today. So we're just gonna jump right in and I want you guys, if you would, just go around and tell me what do you think is being done right in the field of diversity and inclusion right now, right? Because it's been around for a while. At one point, people thought it was a trend. And now we have chief D, uh, diversity and inclusion officers you know, around the world. What do you think from your perspective of what, you, what you're seeing and anything you're reading is being done right? Mm. So I'll just jump in um, and, and I'll tell you that I think there's three things for me, right, in the way I've been viewing the work in the various stops that I've had. The first thing is, is I think we're balancing the head and the heart of the work. Early on, I think in the, in the 2000s, I think early 2000s, we were so much talking about the business case and it became an intellectual exercise of numbers, of representation and, and, and getting just re results that way. 
And now that 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 we've introduced the heart to it, I think the we're finally at a place where if Maslow was still alive, you'd appreciate it, right? Because we're talking about psychological safety. We're talking about yeah. belonging. And if you look at that pyramid, yeah. right, those are the things mm -hmm. that, you know, in order to get self-actualization, you have to go through, right? You have to experience. You have to experience safety. You have to experience belonging. So, so I would tell you that that's, I think, what I've appreciated. That's the first thing. The second thing is I think we are um, in a really interesting place because the neuroscience now is something that gets talked about more and more. It gets, it's now it's been amplified. And the reason why that is important, because I think, you know, if we were just to look at brains, right, and the way that the neuroscientists talk about it, the brains don't have ethnicity. You can't tell gender by looking at a brain. Mm -hmm. But we all know that we have bias. We all know how to, that we need to mitigate bias. And I think the conversation around uh, the introduction of neuroscience to this work has been fascinating. And then the final one, and I think um, there's been some great organizations that have helped with this, right, um, is that we are now bringing in white men to the conversation that I think in the past, um, when we talked about having a conversation around diversity and inclusion, we would bring people of color and women and ask them, how can we help? How can we fix it? How can we improve? And the very people that were needed to be in that room to have this conversation from a dominant culture perspective were not invited into those conversations. Or if they were, they were shamed into doing certain, like, you know, they were being told they were biased, right? And only them. And so to have white men in the room with these conversations, so those three things, right? The head and the heart, the neuroscience, and bringing uh, casting a wider net on who's involved in the conversation. Yeah, I would agree with a, a lot of that. I think um, a lot of that rings true around the kind of short, I guess, um, kind of uh, movement of diversity inclusion when you think about it and how I think how quickly it's grown as a as a movement from kind of a, as you mentioned, Jorge, a, um, forward facing, comms focused, number driven kind of initiative to start. Um, and if you look at a lot of the early DEI leaders at companies, they actually were marketers or they were people in the comms organization. Now I think it's moved and shifted yeah. to more of an HR slash kind of in um, focus, which I think is where it ultimately should lie. Um, so I think it's gr I think it's growth and how much it's been able to grow and expand over time. It's obviously something even in my like obvious um, short tenure as in the workforce, like the last decade or so that I've been in the workforce, it's drastically grown um, and mm -hmm. expanded upon to where we can actually now talk about belonging and allyship mm -hmm. and these other things that I think early on we weren't able to even discuss because it was very surface level. Um, and so I think that's really exciting. I think that's a huge accomplishment. I also think that like while you're built, when you're building the plane as it's flying, obviously it feels like you're making less progress mm -hmm. than you are, but upon reflection, I think exactly what Jorge was mentioning, bringing white people, uh, particularly white men into the conversation, kind of um, fighting the otherism aspect of it and making it more a conversation of owning your privilege in the same sense of me owning my privilege as a white man, even though I am a queer person, um, kind of accepting the limitations of allyship, which uh, we discussed, but kind of like the ways in which an ally can only do so much and how that is okay and that's acceptable. I think that we're starting to have those real conversations now, which I think is really important. Um, and so I think we're really, um, we're really making, we've made a lot of progress and now we're able to really do the more challenging work, work around the actual data and around the actual um, um, creations of belonging and things of that nature. Mm. Great. So, <clears throat> Deborah, I think one of the best things that has happened is the realization that uh, diversity is a word as training has long been a, uh, a burden. And uh, there, I'm reminded of a, of a joke that I heard a long time ago about uh, someone coming into the corporate uh, cafeteria and everyone's eating there happily and announcing that uh, it's now time for the diversity training. And everyone in the cafeteria stands up, runs for the door, runs out, runs down, past the, the parking lot, past the greens, uh, to a cliff, and jumps off. That's how they react, right? So I think that we have come to the understanding that if that's how our attitude is, we're not going to influence anybody. We're not going to change anybody's mind. We're only going to make them mad. 
So here we have a new yeah. way of looking at diversity where we do engage people and we talk to people and we listen listen and one of the okay. things that has to happen in this is that there are a a number of ways in which not only can you give cultural competence and say information but emotional intelligence about it and the emotional yeah. intelligence yes is part of this right is is so necessary if you're going to change the the neural net that is in people's minds and influence the decisions that they make and i think we're paying attention to that like we've never done before and, and tina if i may just to build thank you Deborah, yeah. uh, uh because you're spot on yeah. right and, and to build mm -hmm. and i think you said something that just dawned on me um that it almost feels as though d and i and, and you've added the equity piece in there so you added the d i'm still a boomer yeah. so i still say d and i right <laughs> um um when you think about that now, because of, it feels like it's like a, a discipline now, like project management was years ago, right? So there's a level of credibility because of the things that Deborah has said. But I also think, and, and one of the reasons why we're here, right? Hacking HR, I think um, HR business professionals now look at our, the work that we do as an enabler for them, for them to change environments, to change the culture of teams, to actually unleash the uniqueness that we need to unleash in individual companies, right? Or companies by themselves. And so yeah. that level of credibility now is something that I think business partners and HR should be able to tap into because I think we're there in partnership. We're not there like to be in, in, in competition with them. So it's great that, you know, 85 people are watching this because I think it really speaks to the partnership that we're having. So I, sorry for jumping in like that, but I thought I'd just, add to what the garrison and Deborah said. No, nah, that's perfect. And I'm also just keying in some of the key little nuggets that you guys are dropping. So I'm plugging those in as well, just so everyone can capture those in case they're missing it. Um, so in this current state, do you feel that DEI, I'll say DEI garrison, <laughs> uh, is still is um is effective? You know, what what could be done better? So, I have some other people. Oh, there are some. Yeah. So yeah, I let either one of you take that question. Oh. And is DNI truly effective in its current state? So I think I think um, yes and no, and and then I guess it. You know, now I'm going to sound like a marketer. It depends, right? I think it's <laughs> literally, literally what you're focusing on, right? I, I think if if you do a, uh, a diagnostic, you take a diagnostic approach at your team and your uh, department or your company, it's going to tell you what you should be focusing on, right? I, I don't think that you can take concepts from one company and drop it into another one because the cultures are going to be different, right? But but I think um, it's effective because I think it's evolving, right? Um, there was a time that we only said diversity. And then we added diversity and inclusion, even though the word diversity, to go back to what Deborah was saying as a concept to teach, inclusion was already implied, right? I would argue that equity is already implied in diversity and inclusion. If you're being inclusive, then you should be practicing level level of equity, right? But, but, but we keep adding different terminology because I think we are evolving based on what we focus on. So that's, I'll just uh, start us off there. Garrison, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I kind of see it as like um, a laddering kind of progression where, you know, your your initial goal um, is kind of diversifying your workforce, then it's kind of giving your employees what they need to ultimately succeed. By doing that, you're including them in the conversation, bringing them um, in as decision makers. And then by doing that, you're creating a um, ecosystem where you value people for their differences in their life experiences. And so like, the diversity piece is obviously that um, actual um, diversity. The equity piece is giving them what they need to succeed um, and acknowledging the fact that, they, that everyone needs something different based on where they came from, what their ex life experience is. Uh, inclusion is including them in the conversation, having them have a seat, quote unquote, at the table. And then belonging is not only 
having them be included, but have them be valued and appreciated for who they are. So actually having that sense of belonging and creating a uh, ecosystem where people are not only accepted for who they are, but if you're asking them to bring their authentic self to work, have them actually bring that authenticity to the table and have that be reflective of their work and accepted and acknowledged for that uh, authentic self. So I'd like to, to add something to this uh, conversation about the definitions, and that is we have over the years gone through a number of terms uh, that uh, I can recall beginning with multicultural and, and then, uh, you know, you have the diversity and then the inclusion, then diversity and inclusion, then equity and inclusion, uh, belonging, inclusion, and lots of it. And one of the things that I, I have seen over the years about this is there's a reason, not just because of the different focus, but because of a certain uh, lack of uh, uh, engagement with one of the terms and then going to another and then going to another and hoping mm -hmm. that at some point we've reached the term, right, that gives us the results that we want, that we are aiming for and quite frankly always have been aiming for. I don't think anyone in the early days of quote diversity sat around and said, okay, let's be diverse but not inclusive. No, we don't want that. I don't think that's the issue. The issue is we are in a culture that has reservations about what we're doing. And we are definitely needing to uh, to include white males, uh, but in a way in which it's engaging. And you're right, I think it was you, Jorge, that said that originally, you know, they would come be and not engage because we were blaming and shaming. Mm -hmm. And I can recall organizations telling me, oh, this was years ago, they would never have another diversity person come in and do anything with their people because they brought bad feelings and shame, and that's it. And why would you do that? So I do think that there has been an incredible transformation of the DNI belonging, whatever you would like to call it, uh, with a re realization of how difficult it is to engage people. Uh, I th I still see cafeterias where groups sit and don't talk to each other, where they may not even know each other. If it's a big company, uh, I've been in small companies too with a really diverse team. And they're still not talking to each other. We mm -hmm. really, in this divisive time, are needed more and more. Yeah, yeah I think uh, to touch on that too, yeah. I think like the the um, the terminology is like an umbrella term in the sense that, um, and I kind of relate it back to like the queer kind of LGBTQ plus AI Q U Y Z uh, <laughs> kind of uh, framework that we that we've created in our community, and it's it's kind of like when you when we set up diversity. I think people started looking at it as a marketing headcount, number driven. So then everyone was like, wait, but we also want it to be inclusive. And we also want people to be, uh, it needs to be equitable because you can't uh, include, you know, people of color over white men, and whatever. It should be equality. And then we add, need to add in belonging because just because you're included doesn't mean you, are, you belong at a company. I think Jessica uh, published the diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance and belonging is feeling like you like it is your party and i think that's exactly right of like we've created an umbrella term so that everyone is do checking all the boxes instead of just checking one and just being like oh divert we have diversity because 60 percent of our population is black and 10 percent is hispanic that's not diversity that's just a numbers game and so i think we've created this umbrella term in an effort to make sure that people are doing it all appropriately i know someone also asked about like micro actions and i think that one important thing that i think uh, happens often in DEI is uh, people see the cost of it, whether that be a headcount, um, you know, someone coming in and doing a diversity and inclusion kind of survey and giving you data points of like what your actual demographic data is. 
Um, all those things cost a lot of money. Um, and so I think that a lot of times DEI, especially like in a startup space, like I currently work at a company of 50 people, we obviously don't have a diversity and inclusion council yet. It wouldn't really make sense, but there are micro actions that we're doing, whether that be making sure that we're reading our job descriptions and making sure that they're inclusive um, and that our qualifications aren't uh, limiting to a certain group. Um, for example, at one point when I came into the organization, we were looking for salespeople with five to eight years of experience in SaaS. SaaS enterprise is primarily white men. So clearly we weren't right. setting ourselves up right. to hire women or hire people of color because okay. five to eight years ago, they weren't being hired. Um, so I think that's an example of like micro actions you can do across like from the recruiting perspective. And then internally, we're creating ERGs even at this level of whether it's like right now we have three to four openly queer people and we go out and grab a drink or grab coffee once a month um, in a casual setting. And so an ERG doesn't have to be a highly structured organization. Those are some micro actions that I think uh, can be done without taking the cost into account. Because I think cost oftentimes is the hindrance of DEI and the excuse of like, oh, well, we don't have money to put towards yep. that. And a lot of it doesn't cost money. And, and you know, to build on that, Garrison, I think, I, I, yeah, I think about three things, right? I think about when you're practicing inclusion, you know, I think you can teach leaders to scan the room and give the quietest person in the room a voice. Like how th that would be one micro action, right? That you could teach. Then you can get into a conversation about who is the person that feels most different. Like when you walk into the room, there will be someone who is different, right? If you as a leader can identify that person, how do you make them feel like they belong? So giving them a voice, having them feel like they belong. And then finally, depending on age, depending on tenure, depending on stripe, right, at the company, like people should feel like they can contribute. Um, so those three yes. things, right, giving people a voice, making them feel like they belong, and making them feel like they can contribute adds the value and respect that we talk about. Um, so that's the, the that piece. The other thing totally. is that I have, my, I have, I carry this around from <laughs> DNI. Because, you know, this is <laughs> cute. my daughter taught me a valuable lesson on this. And the lesson is this, depending on the, the problem that you're trying to solve, there are people who saw, see this as a white Rubik's cube, right? And so right away, people say, well, we got to add color. We, you know, it, we got to have red, blue, green, yellow. And then what happens is, and I think Garrison, you walked this through a great story that really started, what you realize is the intersectionality of people mixes this thing up. Right. And yeah. our national reaction is to have a gravitational pull to put people back to their original color. Right. And, and here's the deal. Right. Yeah. We're realizing that people have diversity dimensions that make them up that if I was just to see you as a white male garrison, I would not value you for the uniqueness that you bring. And I could never create an environment that would be good for you. Right. So right. The, the last thing we need is pull people back to, you know, uh, all blue, right? It, it's to literally appreciate them for who they are. So I carry this with yeah. me because I think it's a, it's a really subtle reminder. And actually, when someone asked about how do you, how do you um, teach things, I, I use this to explain it. The final thing, and, and sorry, because I, I, I love this, uh, and Jessica brought it up. I don't know about you, but I wasn't invited to every party. And I don't no. know about you guys, but I was not always asked to dance. And I think we have to be, have a perspective to understand what a definition like that means, right? When we're talking about representation, when we're talking about representation is people need to be invited to join and have access to companies. Then they need to be, have a seat at the table with a voice. And so I just share that with you because I think sometimes we forget that diversity is by design and inclusion is with intent. You have to be intentional. Yeah about creating the environments that we're trying to talk about. So there. <laughs> I think on that on that too, Thank you. it's also that you can belong at a place and be the only. So you don't like, I've belonged at companies and felt strong belonging and inclusion as the only openly queer person. Um, yeah. And that's because I was valued as a queer person. It was subtle things as my CEO inviting my partner along to a, a gala that we were doing, or just things that made the intent known that I was welcomed in my viewpoint and my life experience was welcome. So I uh, just want to throw that out there too, that you don't have to necessarily have an ERG or like a group of people like to the Rubik's Cube point of view uh, to have inclusion and, um, and belonging. It actually is even more important if there are the onlys that they also feel belonging and uh, included as well. And I'd like to back if, if it's all right, if I, if I may, to, sure. to the 
absolutely the issue of um, unconscious bias uh, where people have good intentions right? and hope mm. <laughs> but something goes wrong and they're not sure what and as leaders it's our job to sort it out and one of the things that i think has a large role in having people around the table in conversation with belonging is that unconscious bias because you may not always get the reaction that you had intended as, and then you're left with a group of people around the table who hate each other and wish them badly and then they leave and you don't have the exchange of information that a team needs you don't have that relationship that you were trying to build. So what do we do about that? And one mm -hmm. thing that I really uh, stress in this situation is the more people sit around the table and uh, tell the stories, it's wonderful. But the emotions sometimes involved in it and the biases involved in it can often derail it. And the explanation of why they feel the way they do can add to it. So what I like to do, and people are asking for uh, uh, actual um, suggestions of how you do it, is to give people a sense of emotion metrics. Okay? So that maybe they go, they can give a number to how they feel from one to like four, one being ideal, and for a nightmare so that they don't have to go into incredible detail of exactly how they feel and why they hate the person next to them and how they feel about what they did yesterday because that will help derail and so if you just are able to use that not only does it shorten the emotional angst in the team but it gives people a way to measure how they're feeling. It forces them to think, to have self-awareness. That is such a basic mm -hmm. issue in being able mm -hmm. to have a successfully diverse team, is that self-awareness. Yeah. yeah, and getting yeah. people comfortable Definitely. being vulnerable, right? I mean, I, I shared this story because I think some of us have experienced this. I was tra flying to Denver and the plane was doing this deal, right? And, you know, on the Rocky Mountains, the plane landed beautifully, beautifully. And out of my mouth, Mr. Vice President of DNI comes out the word, my man got us home safe. As I'm walking out, <laughs> it was two women in the cockpit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I share that story because I, I, I had to stop and uh -huh. say, thank you very much. You did a wonderful job. But then I put my head down and walked, right? Because I thought, oh my goodness, like bias is real, unconscious bias, bias is real. Yep. But it's that quick reaction, right? I think we live in that limbic part of our brain. And so the notion yes. of going into that prefrontal cortex to think about things, to what Deborah's saying, it's taxing. And so people don't want to go there. They want right away, they want to react to something, mm -hmm. feel good or feel bad and flee kind of thing. And so I just share that story with you because Oh man, it was like real, you know. I, I, my man brought a little humble pie. And it was two women, right? So, yeah. And on that point too, I mean, um, you can be an ally, and you're still going to deal with unconscious bias. You're still going to be biased as an ally. And I think like one thing that's limiting, and I think that's why I talk a lot about like the limitations of being an ally, because I think it's important to acknowledge that like I came from single mother. Um, I have three amazing sisters. My mom put herself through law school, uh, was the first woman uh, at Old Miss in Mississippi to get her law wow. degree and her Ooh. MBA at the same time. She's a, oh. She was a strong, beautiful woman, uh, one of the only two female lawyers at the time at, of the Mississippi wow. Bar Association. Um, so I'm a very proud ally uh, of women. I've always been closer to women as a queer man uh, in life versus men. M most of my friends are women, but I am a man, and I, um, you know, I grew up uh, with male privilege. Male privilege, and as an ally, there are limitations to what I can do in the fight and justice for women. There are limited things that I can understand about the experiences of women, and I do have biases 
um, unconsciously uh, when it comes to women. And I think like it's okay. And I think there's a defeated mentality that a lot of allies feel of like, oh, I said this or I did this and it, that defensive mm -hmm. mechanism starts kicking in. And I think we need to be better about forgiving ourselves and using it as a learning opportunity. And so one thing I try to instill in the cultures that I create and the DEI initiatives that I like do um, is creating that opportunity of you will mess up. You will have an opportunity where you make a joke mm -hmm. that is um, <laughs> off color. You will do something that right. uh, you didn't mean to intend. And I think apologizing for it, owning it and kind of asking, what is a way that I can correct course in the future? Ultimately, the best way to do it and kind of have that humility, which I know is hard. It's embarrassing and it's challenging, but I think owning it is something that uh, we need to do more of in the space versus right. like kind of pointing blame or kind of making it a um, a kind of um, a blaming mentality, which I think is why more white men are bringing brought to the table because we want to say, I want to give you permission to mess up and to like, Create course. I've had tons of people say, hey, look, as a white person, you're doing this. And I'm like, absolutely, 100%. Tell me exactly what I need to hear so that I can course correct. Right. And I can accept my privilege, which is a challenging thing to do. I, I understand it. Yeah. But it's we all have to do if we're actually going to work together in an inclusive environment. And, and I'd like to add. Yeah, and I can't even. May I? I'd like to answer oh, go, go ahead, something Deborah. that uh, Hillary put up uh, uh, asking me about other ways to look at this and share with you that uh, about 20 years ago, I created a system, I called it the matrix model management system. And it is a system uh, that is sequential of how you take somebody and bring them from where they are to where you want them to be. Instead of just telling them, pay attention, be different, no stuff, right? That's yeah. not going to do the job. So yep. this, this system, uh, which is based on my, my uh, academic work as a cultural anthropologist and also uh, an urban planner, takes you from the, uh, the understanding, the self-awareness that comes of the intersectionality, thank you Jorge for bringing that up, and what that might look like, and doing it in a way that's fun. Can you imagine doing diversity training and having everybody laugh and have fun? If you're having fun, you're actually absorbing it. And that's what one of the things we, we, we aim for. And going from that intersectionality awareness to the emotional intelligence and then to the decision making, le leaving that last, okay, can change the neural net inside people and can change the way teams work together. Uh, and that means that you have the ability then to absorb the information you want people to absorb. Instead of just saying, well, these people are different. This is how they, they shake hands. Remember that and you're good. That's not going to do it. That's just not going to do it. You need to be able to encompass, to engage, right? And that means a new way of thinking. So that's kind of what I've, I've, yeah. I've looked at. And when we do the training, it's in small groups. And I make sure they're diverse. And maybe don't even know each other. Having said that, it's a large room. Usually the people who know each other sit together, right? In the small groups. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Um, I'm very mean. I say, okay, three people in that room, stand up, go sit someplace else. Okay? Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't. I do the same thing. <laughs> Thank right. you. Yep. Sometimes that's yep. what a leader has to do. Engage. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's not as comfortable, but yep. we're going to have fun. Go for it. There you go. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Deborah. And, you know, you're right about the emotional intelligence piece and also the unconscious bias, because whenever I'm working with organizations about their diversity and inclusion program, you have to touch on all of those. They're hand in glove, right? So you can't leave one without the other. And I also dig into the microaggressions, intersectionality and helping them understand a lot of times they hear the words, but they don't know what the real world examples look and feel like until they're in a room in a safe environment where we can have those fun conversations and say, you know what? 
This is a safe space. It's okay to make mistakes here. Ask the dumb questions, the things that you've always wondered about, because this is the time to do that. Because these are all teachable moments. And I think the more people realize, instead of you know reacting in a way where you're offended, say, you know what? Let me explain to you why what you said was wrong. Or let me explain to you why, how what you said made me feel. And that to me is a teachable moment. And that's when people start to really open up and understand right in, a, in, a, in the moment uh, opportunity of what diversity and inclusion looks and feels like and how it should be moving um, and innovating throughout the organization and just in everyday conversations. Mm. So it's even outside of the workplace. Oh, yeah. So with, with that um where do you think where do you guys think diversity and inclusion is going um in the future where do you see from your again from your research or what you're doing in your organizations or deborah in your work um from your clients where do you see um the demand and the um the the trajectory if you will of diversity and inclusion i don't want anyone <laughs> Um, right. You know, I, I guess. Or yeah, yeah. So for me, you know, as as, as as Deborah was creating that framework for us, one of the things that just hit me, uh, I was getting a reaction to, was this notion of cultural competency, right? And I think when you build all that dexterity and agility to move through differences, um, um, develop a strong emotional intelligence and understanding of people, you're actually building up your cultural competency to be able to react to differences, right? In different cultures. So I think as where the work is going, I think to in order for us to get the diversity of thought that all companies are looking for in the spirit of innovation, we're gonna have to create environments that allow people to learn about how to be more culturally competent, to be able to unleash the talent that's in the room when the leader is not present. I think in the past, a lot of this work has been top down. And so we teach leaders. And sometimes I think we forget that a leader is in their own individual journey. So there is kind of like they're in their own comfort zone. Right. And so in order for them to learn the things that we're teaching and in order for that person to grow, they have to jump into that fear zone in order for them to be vulnerable, to begin to learn and so that they can grow and develop that cultural competency. And so the things that we try to do here and the things that we're going to do here at Granite Construction is, you know, in a company of 7,000 people, in any given meeting, there will be more people together that are not in leadership roles with stripes, but they have to create the leaders, the inclus inclusive environment to have a, 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 a meaningful meeting. And number two, to onboard people, right? They create the environment just as much as a leader. Yes, permission given by a leader and, you know, they empower people, but it's, it's, it's everyone else that creates. It's almost like we have to turn that uh, pyramid upside down and really think about mm -hmm. critical mass yeah. is about everyone, not getting all on the same page, but understanding the concepts to move this work forward. So I think cultural competency and how we can get critical mass in having people understand what we mean by DNI, those are the two things I'll share. Yeah, that's great. Um, <clears throat> I think that we're moving um, as is the um, overall like business world, the corporate world in general, um, as well as HR is kind of moving towards the future of what work is uh, in remote um, employees uh, today than there ever has been. That will continue to happen. AI will change the workforce um, in some impactful way that we all discuss at every conference. Um, and uh, people are being asked to bring their authentic self to work. Um, and that is also in part to the fact that we are in an always on um, in an always on culture where you have your phone on you. We know that you have access to your email. We know that you're a text away. Um, so work and life are blending um, ever so much. And so I think that DEI is going to be impacted by that as well. Um, I think one great way that that's going to happen is that DEI is also going to continue to expand to religious views, uh, political views, which often uh, have been taboo or going to have to come into play where um, if you're asking someone to bring their authentic self to work um, they're, and they're an immigrant, they're going to be affected by immigration policies and you're going to have to discuss that at work. Right. Um, if you are going to be an inclusive place and you're going to invite queer people, uh, you're going to have to deal with trans issues and trans rights um, if you have trans employees. And so uh, more and more things that are considered political are going to have to be brought into the conversation. So I think 
that's one thing that's going to happen is that more and more uh, taboo conversations or things that, you know, 10 to 15 years ago or even today might be seen as taboo and still not spoken about at work are going to have to be in the same way that queer people are just now being able to talk about their partners openly. Um, and that's only happening in urban areas. In Mississippi, you can still be fired for being gay. So uh, I think legally, on, as a second point, we're going to have to start um, making sure that work um, and employees and corporations are also taking this to the legal front as well because we can't just rely on urban and or large companies that, um, that have to do DEI from a marketing perspective or from a um, in inclusive uh, kind of internal perspective to do it. We have to make sure that small uh, corporations and places that where the state law currently is not backing them up is also creating uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives. If the law won't do it, HR and internal um, functions are gonna have to do it. And so I think that's where I hope DEI goes is that we work towards the legal, um, but we don't rely on the legal. Um, we rely on the internal organization right. and do it because it's the right thing to do, not because we're required to do it. And that goes from parental rights um, and offerings to uh, yeah. queer rights and offerings to <laughs> benefits that we offer to uh, the people that we hire, to the diversity and management, we shouldn't wait on the law to do it for us. Okay. So one of the things that you brought up, I, I think is key, and that is the issue of both politics and religion. And that we're living in a time where both of these issues are on people's minds in various different ways. They, if they affect our, our thinking, our conversations, our policies. One of the things I've found over the years, as you have, is that people are very reluctant to deal with it. Um, they yeah. hope in silence it'll go away, maybe, and they won't ever have to deal with it. They'll have a right. couple of policies in place and they'll point to it and go there, right? But it's a, a, an issue of personal engagement, not just policy making. One of the things that I have really focused on over the years, uh, because if not me, then who, uh, has been the issue of religious diversity, thought diversity, belief systems. These are so key to how to just about anything. And yet, because we've had a system where uh, you learn about religion and beliefs in your own religious institution or family, but you don't learn anything about anybody else's as a kid. You have to gather it as an adult. And most people don't and won't. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why I've created books that, uh, that address religious diversity in schools, in, in the workplace. I created something called Quick Reference Religious Diversity Cards at the request of law enforcement because they need to have that kind of information in order to deal with communities we all need this information and the ability to absorb it because that's how we are going to be able to interface in this divisive world is to understand and appreciate where people are coming from yeah. and people are going to be very different in their beliefs yeah. And, and you know, Deborah, yeah. Deborah, if I may, yeah, um, because I think I think what you're bringing um, is something that I think people have been asking about is how you deal with conflict, right? These conversations, yeah. it's interesting how we talk about them in conflict, but as a practitioner, I put up a diversity dimension, right? View and you know, primary, secondary, cultural, right? Organizational diversity dimensions. Religion, right, is one of them. And if I, as a practitioner, are going to put that out there, then I should create an environment where you could have a conversation around religion. The irony to me on that is this. As a Latino, right, I grew up with religion every day. My mom would tell me, first God, right? Primero Dios. Anything I wanted, right, God will provide. I mean, everything was about religion. It wasn't mm -hmm. until I started working in corporate America that I couldn't bring that to the table. And I would tell you, you know, there are certain cultures that religion is a staple, right, of their life, like Bible study on Wednesday, you know, I mean, yeah. choir practice, you name it. But then all of a sudden, there's a dominant culture that basically says you can't talk about that because right. it's uncomfortable. But those conversations, the cafeteria that you were talking about, people are talking about it at the cafeteria. 
people are opening up that book and yeah. they're talking about verses and quoting things, right? Because the, that, that's who they are. And so you can't help but have the conversation. It's just you have to create the environment that allows people to talk about it. Because in a polarizing like environment, um, you, you need to move forward because you can't be across the room thinking that person doesn't like have the same beliefs that I do. And then you find out they're just as convicted as you are. And, it, and it's amazing when that right. happens, right? When they realize, oh, your conviction yeah. is just as strong, if not stronger than mine. Yeah. So I, I yeah. think what you're think, bringing up that was so powerful. Yeah, and I think to that point too, um, though it's taboo, I think you're exactly right, Jorge. Conversations are happening. You know, um, if you, I worked in Mississippi, um, I grew up in Mississippi and sitting around like, uh, in that environment, people consider that everyone around them is conservative and everyone around them is Baptist or Christian. And so the conversations are happening because of the assumed uh, kind of responsibility. In New York City today, we're yeah. dealing with in our office, people assume that everyone is liberal. And so they're talking about liberal things and some conservative people, one, don't want to expose the fact that they're conservative and two, feel uncomfortable. And so in the same way that I, as a queer person, if someone's talking about, you know, trans rights or the fact that there's a gender, gender neutral bathroom law in this state or that state would feel uncomfortable and not raise it. Those conversations are happening. And oftentimes either people associate with people at their work that they know identify similarly, similarly to them and they're having those conversations or they're assuming that everyone around them has that kind of framework um, and they're having those conversations. So I think it has to be addressed uh, regardless, because um, especially in this divisive time, people's actual lives are seemingly at stake. Uh, some underprivileged groups do feel that based on how the election will go, but also based on where things are headed as a cultural consensus um, and like where the discourse is headed is actually going to affect their day to day lives and their safety. That if they don't feel safe at work and they don't feel included at work, it actually is becoming more and more of a risk for them in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so I think where, especially in places where the law is not on their side, um, that actually hiding that aspect of their life um, is something that a lot of people do. My sister and her husband right now uh, live in a conservative part of Alabama and they don't speak about uh, politics or religion at work, uh, but they're constantly exposed to it and they're constantly hearing about Donald Trump and hearing about the progressive policies that are happening on the conservative side that everyone agrees with. And they're being exposed to that, but they choose not to say anything because they know that if they raise it to their manager who probably agrees with them, it won't go anywhere. And so I think it's something that we have to address because we can't wait on society to change. I think it's gonna become even more and more okay. of an issue at work because I think the more and more we bring our authentic selves, why should I not be able to talk about my political views? Why should about things that are affecting my life um and so i think it's something that we have to be able to address and we have to be able to talk about and it's something that like jorge mentioned is something that we've all been taught growing up that we shouldn't talk about so if someone is talking about it it's like oh you shouldn't really be mentioning that and that kind of otherism is the reason why queer people weren't able to talk about their partners or why women weren't able to talk about their kids um because it was thought, thought of as if you're talking about that you're not focused on work um, and now we know that's not the case. So I think it's going to bleed out into all these different situations, whether that be religious needs of needing to take off for a holiday um, or, you know, fast at a function or not drink because you don't you don't drink. And so you can't go to that happy hour. You're going to start thinking a lot more around how those things affect people and what that implication is. You know, when you when you talk about just the very basic issue of what you're going to drink. What you gonna eat? What's gonna be served at that corporate party, that reception, okay? at the luncheon that where you have a meeting at? These are the things you need to think about ahead of time so that you do include everybody. And yeah. it's, it's an amazing thing. When I've gone yeah. to a banquet and they put in front of me right, a shrimp cocktail and the, the Yiddish in me comes on and it's I can't eat that. <laughs> so what are you thinking? Why did you pay attention to coming? That's one issue. But there's That's another right. thing that comes to mind in all of this, and that is people are going to want to know, what are the limits 
of all of this? Mm. How much can we tolerate mm. without it being yes. up in our face? And the reason I say that is in, in part because we are online so much and some of what is online and influences us right. is a little crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And we are looking at uh, um, not just, not uh, something beyond differences of opinion to out and out hate. And there are things there yeah. that are, are simply not acceptable in, in the workplace. And mm -hmm. we have to have a discussion of where that line is drawn mm -hmm. because we do not want mm -hmm. to encourage the kind of hate that leads to, to violence. Uh, and, and we are being pushed in that direction mm. constantly by some of those strange things online. Uh, yeah. And people are not aware even half the time of what they're looking at and say some of the memes that are online, mm -hmm. where they came from. Uh, and I say this because mm -hmm. uh, my father in World War II was a U.S. military intelligence officer assigned to interrogate Nazi prisoners of war. And they got, there's a sucking in kind of mentality that just, I cannot... I cannot do that. So there you have it. <laughs> so we've gotten a five minute warning from Enrique. So <laughs> you guys hit on all of the points that I wanted to make sure we covered today. And I'm glad we ended talking about, um, you know, political views and religion, because you're right. When we're telling people to be their true authentic self, all of that comes to the table. And you're right, Deborah. I do agree with you. Um, I'm sure organizations are start going to start questioning at some point. Where do we draw the line, right? Of course, we don't want hate speech. We don't want intolerance. Um, we don't want people to feel that they have to take, you know, five or six steps backwards once we said, okay, it's okay to be your true self within reason, right? So I think that's something that a lot of organizations and people in HR and in the DNI space need to start thinking ahead of because. I think that's going to continue to be part of the conversation as this this um, profession, if you will, this feel evolves. So any final thoughts yeah. from these wonderful panelists? And thanks for being here, everyone, for joining in. And yeah, thanks you for know, all your uh, so real quick, I, to address, sorry. I saw Stephanie's comment about uh, yeah. disability. I, I, I was going to jump, sure we... jump on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay. so let me yeah. that's very important. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to say this, that I've heard HR practitioners say, that if I do my job, I'm gonna work myself out of a job. And I've always felt like, like yes. something visceral about that comment. I, I, I know what the intent is, but the impact that is making on me mm -hmm. is saying, then we're not gonna value the diversity dimensions that are so critical. And one, because anytime that we talk about diversity and inclusion, we always focus on race and gender, that there are some, some dimensions that are get disenfranchised because of the way we measure, the way we speak and because of the sameness that we like to be in and not appreciating the difference that really exists. So that's why we have to continue having conversations around the LGBTQ community, right? That's why pronouns and now this work around that work is so critical. And, and the reason why I'm reacting to what Stephanie mentioned, disability is one that I think rarely gets talked about. And here we are with two minutes left and now we're talking about it because Stephanie asked that question and Garrison and I reacted to it, right? And it is so true. This is why yeah. this work is ongoing. This is why the wisdom that Deborah has, I believe, right? As she's written so many yes. books about it because we're gonna be talking about yeah. diversity dimensions as it evolves. So um, that's all I'm gonna say, sorry. Uh, but I need yeah, to- Yeah, no, you're fine. I, I know, I was, gonna, I was gonna basically say that as well. I think that the main thing, particularly when it comes to disability and when it is mentioned, it's from a visible perspective, because I think you're correct in the sense that we look at color and we look at uh, sex and we look at the visible, disabil uh, like the visible diversity often. And I think that's where the marketing the data that we were so honed on five, 10 years ago really was shortened because you were only looking at the physical. And I think so much of disability is invisible um, and not visible to the human eye. And so I think there needs to be a lot of work done to make sure that people know that accommodations will be made for them, whether that is uh, they need a, a therapy dog or they need like a dog on site or whether that is that they, need, they can't use a computer for more than three hours a day. There's a million disabilities um, that are invisible to the eye that you might not be able to perceive. 
Um, and that also yes. is very closely identified, and that's why I feel it so passionately as well, at, at, in the queer community. Um, you know, uh, there are plenty of gender non-conforming and trans individuals who don't want to pass. Um, and passing is basically the idea that they need to fit in and look like the gender they describe, they prescribe to or, or look like the gender that they are biologically, um, they were biologically given. And so I think that ultimately, um, like making sure that people can feel accepted for who they are and be embraced by the pronouns that they um, identify with, um, the pronouns in which they should be given um, is so important because I think that the next stage of diversity and inclusion, or at least if I have anything to do with it, will be when it comes to the invisibility um, aspect yeah. of diversity and inclusion, the queer experience, yeah. um, the parent who you might not know as a parent, um, the disabled person, the person that's taking care of a sick family member, those things that if that aren't visible to you um, by the human eye and would only be raised if they address it um, or if they open you about it is something that I think we need to do a better job about. People spend more time at work than they do anywhere else and in the same way that we focus on our kids spending more time at school and making sure that they're not being bullied or harassed making sure that they feel included making sure that they belong we need to do the same with work with ourselves as adults yes I absolutely agree and let me add one last aspect to that um, my I think we got cut off oh, but go okay. ahead uh, <laughs> my brother was autistic mm. I am I am able to deal with autism and I have been asked many times to help those who have high Asperger's syndrome in particular. And it has been an honor to do that. We need to have an understanding of the emotional and mental uh, issues around autism and different ways of thinking like that. Uh, and I hope that there will be some direction in the future towards that. And I'm willing to help if anyone was willing to go there. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, everyone. We went a little over. Enrique, don't be upset. This is so good and juicy and lots of good nuggets dropped. So everyone, thank you for joining us. Thank you to my panelists, Orhey Garrison and Deborah. Uh, please follow them on LinkedIn if you're not already connected. Missing out. And follow me too at Point M Session. Yeah. Um, so everyone, enjoy the rest of the conference. And so glad to kick it off. Thank you. Paint up. Thank you guys. Great job. You're an awesome Wonderful. moderator. Yep. Yeah.